professor gobor gomes he is a world renowned disability scholar uh, and his rights and advocacy in the field of psychosocial disability found mention in the narratives uh, and the book of kerry uh, kennedy titled uh, uh, speak truth to power human rights defenders who change the world among, along with 50 other human rights defenders sir has been part of the un uh, committee on persons with disabilities from 2011 to 2013 sir it's an honor for us to have you it's an honor to be here thank you sir sir my first question is uh, as regards the social integration of say the blind or the deaf uh, it can be said in short by behavioral adjustments or infrastructure uh, infrastructural modifications but how do you integrate the psycho socially disabled in society well that's a very good question uh, before trying to give an answer to this uh, let me go back to the introduction very kind introduction you uh, made about me uh, i don't like the idea that we were changing the world because the world is not in a very nice shape these days but certainly we do have our share of responsibility and i think that it's really high time to become humble again and deal with issues like the question uh, you raised suggest uh let me also tell you that uh, in uh, the current understanding of disability all the attempts to integrate people with disabilities into society was a failed uh experiment because integration basically says that yes you can be part of us you can be part of mainstream society as long as you manage to live our life and for some blind people and for some deaf people to some extent this could work yes uh you see it well that when we come to people with psychosocial disabilities in an old language uh, this is the group whom uh, were defined by medical psychiatric diagnosis and also people with intellectual disabilities using the old fashioned name people with mental retardation uh, this never works because we are in a sense you know uh different or in a different point of a spectrum from what is considered by society as normal that integration is possible only if we uh, gave up our identities which doesn't really work so instead of integration the convention on the rights of persons with disabilities speaks about inclusion and the qualitative difference between inclusion and integration is that while in integration mainstream society accepts you if you can live according to their norms mm -hmm. in inclusion entire society needs to change needs to transform itself needs to renegotiate the term what is normal in order to allow you to participate on an equal basis with others in society on your own terms negotiated terms you also need to negotiate a society also needs to negotiate this and if we start from uh, the uh, aspiration of creating or transforming our existing societies into inclusive ones mm -hmm. then i think that the chance that the emerging new societies will really be able to have people with psychosocial disabilities people with intellectual disabilities as well as any other people with disabilities as equal members to them thank you sir so my next question is uh, in previous interviews you have mentioned about the ordeal of the uh, psychosocially challenged persons when they are put in the social health care centers as against the, them being with their family members so obviously after upgrading these centers don't you think as a starting point such people should be there for in the centers where they are trained to 
cope up with the challenges of the world rather than like my experience has been that with my disability my own family members have not been able to cope up very well so don't you think that such people can first be at the centers and then uh, expose to the world well i i do not believe in uh, one single efficient and good recipe uh, and I think that is the other lesson we learned in the negotiations of the convention. Any effort to come up with one single policy for all people with disabilities or all people belonging to a particular impairment group will fail as they have failed. It will be good for some people, but it will be very bad. It may be very bad for others. Now, <clears throat> for instance, if we ask uh, about the possible role of the families in uh, bridging the gap between the person with disability and mainstream society, or being a broker you know, between uh, mainstream society and uh, the person with disability, helping with the negotiations between the two of them, may work and if the family is uh, open towards such uh, an exercise and if they are ready to accept that the leadership in this process should be with the person with disability then the family can be the best vehicle of inclusion but uh, as uh, you experienced in your impairment group I would say I experienced in uh, uh, my impairment group the very same thing. Most families, most parents do not know what to do when they have a family member or a child with a psychosocial disability. And uh, unlike in your impairment group, you know, in uh, the group of people with psychosocial disabilities, very often narrate that the family and the parents actually contributed to their disability, mm -hmm. uh, which makes the chances, you know, to have a constructive working together towards assisting and uh, reinforcing or in enforcing inclusion for the person with disability uh, are not really good. So there is no one single uh, recipe. recipe but certainly, I would say that nobody can expect that a person with a psychosocial disability without any human and social support could easily uh, fight for his or her inclusion in mainstream society uh, or vice versa. But in many instances, the families, the parents, unfortunately, cannot provide the necessary support. And that is why other forms of support, peer support groups, uh, personal assistance sort of supports coming from one helping or assisting person can be vital. Also, if you are talking about adults, typically psychosocial disability is something which is not uh, a born-in condition. It develops you know, throughout the case and when it really emerges as a full-blown disability, the person typically is uh, at his or her young adulthood. So we are talking mostly about people uh, who are adults and necessarily they should have the same right to decide whether they want to live with their families or they want to establish their own family or just they want to go to the forests, you know, to have time for uh, meditation, contemplation, healing, uh, and many other options may be very much there. So again, I see in uh, several countries, including my own country, Hungary, that policymakers would be happy to say, yes, it is primarily the duty of the families and parents, and let us give them some tokenistic amount of money support, support yeah. and let them do this. Now, this is not a good policy, while it may work for a small number of people. Mm -hmm.
I, I think, uh, um, Professor uh, Gombos, uh, from what you have responded, I think what flows is uh, a question of mine which I had put out for you, is that we had been talking about this indivisibility of civil and political rights and socio-economic rights. Uh, theoretically, it is being acknowledged that yes, they are indivisible, yet when it comes to practice, what we find is, you know, uh, rights are still prioritized and often uh, economic cost-benefit analysis is something which is brought in uh, to prioritize them. Uh, so my question is that uh, so far as persons with disabilities is concerned and the laws and policies uh, you know, uh, addressing them are concerned, how far do you think is this indivisibility accepted by the governments or by the international community? Uh, I am not very optimistic regarding this and uh, we don't need to go to the governments you know, who in the old-fashioned human rights thinking are the enemies. Yes, yes, I would agree. Yes. If we just uh, do our own soul search you know, and look into the human rights mm. uh, field, we find that while we are teaching about the indivisibility of human rights, True. Uh, when we are practitioners, unfortunately we immediately forget about that mm -hmm. and we we uh, pick up one particular right mm. and forgot about the others, yes. or more fairly, it is something like you know zooming with the camera. Uh, when we emphasize the indivisibility, then we need a super camera, mm. uh, which mm. can give you an equally sharp image mm. about the things which are close to the camera, which are farther, which are very far, and they together give what human rights are. Mm -hmm. But the cameras we usually have are not super cameras. So when you zoom onto one particular detail, uh, one right, then all the others, which are closer or farther, uh, become blurred. And that's a big problem because this can be further abused uh, by those who want to prioritize, while if we really believe in the at least theoretical indivisibility, it must be evident that uh, no prioritization is legitimate on the law. Hmm. Now, when uh, we are working, for instance, on uh, a finite short term action plan, then I can imagine that a certain prioritization is absolutely necessary. Okay. Uh, now, the issue is that uh, evidently the civil political aspects of human rights should never be a question of prioritization. Uh, they should be immediately provided, okay. which does not necessarily mean that it can be provided overnight. Uh, you know, sometimes, for instance, if we talk about the right to political participation, in many countries, people with psychosocial disabilities mm. and people with intellectual disabilities can be deprived of their right to political participation. Uh, you cannot really expect that the attitudes of the legislature uh, will change overnight true, true. and will be ready and politically willing to make a radical change mm. in their electoral yeah. laws. But certainly what is required is that the government who is ruling right now must come up with a time-bound plan, mm -hmm. program, mm -hmm. what they will do within what time frame to ensure that the necessary mind changes Mm -hmm. will happen. Okay. Uh, now, if we come to the social economic aspects of human rights, uh, which have more significant resource implications, so it's not about the political will, but also about resources, resources yes. <clears throat> then, again, some sort of priorities will necessarily come. Mm -hmm. If a government does not prioritize, it is a prioritization mm. itself also. Mm. It, it is a laissez-faire mm. uh, approach, which is not necessarily the best one. True, true. I, I do think that uh, likely the 
best approach in terms of fairness mm -hmm. is when uh, the government in its prioritization considers a short list for themselves. One is that uh, the prioritization shall never mean that they pick up certain groups of people with mm. disabilities, mm. say mm. the deaf, mm. Mm. and then they make legislation on mm. the recognition of sign language, okay. they create an action plan and allocate, allocate budget for the uh, training of uh, sign interpreters, etc. Et mm. mm. And they do nothing for people with other impairments, okay. Okay. saying that we will come to them later. later. Mm -hmm. This is not good. Mm -hmm. I think it is much better if they do some of this task of making the world accessible to deaf people. Uh, at the same time, they do similar uh, measures for blind people. Mm -hmm. They also consider some of the most urgent needs of people with psychosocial disabilities, etc. So prioritization may be legitimate, but it should never result in a situation where some impairment groups mm -hmm. are treated much more or much less favorably than others. The other is uh, that uh, an easy prioritization would be that, okay, now in the next, say, 10 years, our priority will be employment, right to work, mm -hmm and we will do nothing on any other mm. social economic aspect. While on the surface this may sound uh, justifiable or legitimate, mm. if we think a little bit deeper, uh, it turns out to be absolutely nonsense. Why? You cannot do meaningful reforms in the field of employment, for instance, if you do not change your education, education system. system. Yes. And yes. then the interrelatedness, mm. which is the mm. other very famous or infamous aspect yes. of human yes. rights, comes into the, onto the stage. And uh, if you do this exercise with other selected uh, social economic sort of right, you will also find that it's impossible to do that sort of a mm. prioritization. Mm. Mm. So this for me implies that likely the good approach for prioritization is to do progressively something on each and every social economic aspect mm -hmm. of human rights and then do the progressive realization accordingly. Okay, I, I think uh, even yesterday's, uh, during your opening session, uh, sir, and even now as you were responding to my earlier question, you are mentioning uh, accessibility as something which is very much uh, necessary and significant for attaining the participation of people with disabilities in the mainstream. Uh, uh, however, uh, if we look at uh, UNCRPD, it has not defined accessibility. And yet, when we continue to look around the physical and the virtual world around us, uh, accessibility uh, is something which is not being given as much of uh, attention as it requires. So, uh, to your belief, how much more of uh, you know challenge or progression has been made, uh, you know, uh, in terms of accessibility, whether physical or virtual, to ensure the participation and inclusion of people with disabilities? Well, it's, it's a good question. Again, uh, here I am a little bit more optimistic okay. than uh, okay. on the earlier question. A little bit because uh, I really do think that uh, the movement, uh, the disability movement, uh, the disability rights movement, started in most places of the world with uh, campaigning for a more accessible society. And <clears throat> this was one of the first issues, you know, wheelchair users came up with, mm. and uh, their protests, you know, and campaigns are very visible. Mm -hmm. uh, 
but for blind people, for deaf people, equally uh, accessibility, I mean, in their case, not only physical accessibility, but also, or even more dominantly, uh, communicational uh, and related uh, accessibility are uh, vital and have been vital. Now, at least in terms of awareness that the world as it is, is not accessible, we have made or they have made a huge progress. Mm -hmm. And what I see is that, especially in urban areas, more and more people at least understand that they should do something differently. Mm -hmm. And the concept of universal design is spreading mm -hmm. slowly but surely. Okay. Uh, the problem starts when we go to the rural areas. True. Yeah. You know where a person with physical disability, a person with uh, a dying person, a deaf person, can be completely isolated from mm -hmm. the rest mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. village. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the case of Nepal, they can be isolated from everything, you know, at the altitude of I do not know how many thousand meters, they will be cut off mm. Uh, mm. from the world, uh, which is not the case in Kathmandu. Mm. So Nepal is a poor country also in Kathmandu, but uh, uh, large cities have uh, different challenges mm. than rural areas. In, the, in terms of accessibility, I think it is easier to do something in the urban environment. But certainly, this is again a prioritization which is not fair. True, yes, uh, yes. Another mm. concern uh, regarding accessibility comes in when we uh, come to people with intellectual disabilities mm -hmm. and people with psychosocial disabilities, including people with autism, for instance. Uh, plain language easy to understand materials, uh, not only materials, but uh, our skills to communicate with uh, someone uh, who uses a very particular language, a plain language, or in the case of psychosocial disability, a metaphoric language, mm -hmm. a symbolic language, or in case of people with autism, it can be that they do not use verbal communication, and then uh, outsiders will automatically believe that they are very stupid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it may turn out that uh, they have uh, very sophisticated uh, cognitive skills, just uh, they have uh, very uh, severe uh, support needs, very strong, very intensive support needs uh, in uh, terms of their communication. Usually policymakers, frankly, if we look into ourselves, look into the operations of cross-disability organizations, very often we forget about these groups. Mm. Then we think about and strategize on accessibility. But again, I do think that the single most area of life where I think that in the past, say, three decades, well before the CRPD. Mm -hmm. Accessibility is the area where most progress happened, and still it's very far from mm -hmm. what is necessary. Mm -hmm. But certainly the CRPD started to uh, speed up this process. So I with, just with uh, Van Kaviat, sir. Uh, namely that in the field of uh, civil aviation, I heard from many wheelchair user colleagues that since the entry into force of the CRPD, ironically and paradoxically, their accessibility to uh, aviation mm -hmm. has been even more restricted mm -hmm. than before. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Yes, sir. So, uh, and, uh, sir, uh, can you elucidate the objectives and uh, success of Think Globally, Act Locally initiative which you started with Professor Danda? Uh, well, that is a project which uh, hasn't come uh, to completion yet and uh, frankly we both are a little bit skeptical if it will ever uh, come true, but we have been working on it a lot 
and uh, originally we uh, planned that to be a book uh, about how the CRPD came into existence, that is the global scene, and what implications may come from the way how the convention was made in the United Nations, and also some of the most revolutionary normative components of the treaty, uh, how they can be translated into domestic and local mm -hmm. arenas. That is why they globally, uh, locally uh, play with the words uh, was included. Uh, now then, we had to learn that the exercise was much more complex than we expected. And time was elapsing, and actually, the CRPD entered into force, and after the entry into force, the real concrete, very practical questions arose. Because it turned out that governments who were to implement the convention did not understand certain government duties which are under the convention. And uh, they started to change the laws, they made some pilot programs, they, they made different things. And when the United Nations Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities monitored, started uh, to monitor the domestic interpret uh, implementation of the convention, then they had to discover that uh, in many instances what the governments did uh, with uh, good faith uh, had nothing to do with about the convention, sometimes went against convention. Let me tell you one concrete example. In the field of education, China proudly reported to the committee that since uh, the CRPD entered into force in China, they built hundreds of special schools for children with intellectual disabilities. Mm -hmm. Now, this is exactly the opposite to what CRPD mm -hmm. wants to happen. So when it turned out that what are the uh, issues which the governments do not understand or do not want to understand, then the situation, you know, how to do this think globally and act locally can be really realized, or what suggestions we can come up with. Well, now again, a few years elapsed, and the committee made uh, not an enormously rich jurisprudence, but uh, uh, reviewed a relatively large number of countries already. So we can have a relatively reliable map about what are the most contested or misunderstood duties in the states under the convention. And also we can see much more good practices on the same. So now we are thinking about returning to the project, because we think that now we have a good and concrete enough material to compile and uh, give an analytic introduction to the compilation, uh, and which can be useful because we do not want to produce a book for uh, the drawers. Only. Uh, Professor Gombo, since we are talking about the treaty, uh, I had this particular question on my mind as to since these days we have these multiple uh, human rights instruments, there is a, quite a possibility that, uh, you know, um, when a, a particular treaty uh, deals with a specific article or maybe a right, there could be a parallel treaty which interprets it maybe in a contradictory manner. Now, in such kinds of cases, uh, what kind of responses would each of the treaty body would give? Uh, is there any procedure or mechanism through which there could be some coordination being created between the committees or even uh, you know, making one convention speak to the other convention? Is, is there a possibility of that sort? Certainly, uh, one uh, treaty uh, talking to another does happen. Mm -hmm. Now, how officially it uh, happens, that's a different question. There mm -hmm. are various layers to that. 
And my experience with the UN, both when I participated in the negotiations of the treaty and also when I was a member of the International Monitoring Treaty Body, is that likely the most important things in the United Nations happen informally. So you should never underestimate the importance of informal, uh, not formally official exchanges. Mm -hmm. And I am aware that it has been happening, and I do think that actually this is the only way. Uh, when you reach a certain level of uh, uh, sharing in uh, understanding why the two treaty bodies' views are different, mm -hmm. then you can go to a more formal okay. communication. Mm -hmm. And the formal communication should be as transparent as possible. Well, the informals, by nature, will not be transparent. But in the informal procedure, there are many ways, exactly because they are not official, how academics, civil society experts mm -hmm. can also have an input. And they can also have more formal ways. Mm -hmm. uh, because when, for instance, a treaty body uh, works for a general comment on uh, an article mm. uh, which has already dealt, been, uh, dealt with by another mm. treaty body in a significantly different way, in a conflicting way, then uh, according to the, the uh, unwritten rules how treaty bodies operate, the treaty body will uh, send out an open invitation to basically everyone mm -hmm. to submit comments. their comments mm -hmm. and views. Mm -hmm. So even through the four, at least the first formal steps mm -hmm. of uh, a discourse yes. on yes. the particle matter is open. Yes. Mm -hmm. And what is not open is really so informal that uh, when we are here, the outcome will be hopefully open and public. Mm -hmm. But you know, we, before the camera started working, we have had certain chats, you know, made, had made certain jokes which do not belong to the public. Uh, this is one uh, thing. Another thing is that I think that you need to think creatively, and this is something where the lawyers are particularly well educated. Uh, I can share you with one. Uh, story and that is the story of uh, the right to vote which is just the minimum core of the right to political participation and we do know that the human rights committee has their general comment which is still in force as much as a general comment can be enforced where they uh, they, they basically say among other things, that uh, uh, people who uh, have some mental, they do not use the term disability, but basically that is what they describe, can be lawfully deprived of their right to vote. And then they said that under what conditions this can be done. And the conditions include such things as uh, objectivity, uh, proportionality, is something else. And uh, the CRPD committee from the very beginning uh, had a consensus in ourselves that what the CRPD says about political participation, including the right to vote, does not allow for any exception. Any. So when we reviewed the first country where the right to vote was central and also had been considered by the Human Rights Committee as one of the progressive countries because they did not allow for a blanket deprivation of the right to vote for, say, people diagnosed with mental illness or people with intellectual disabilities. They required an individual case-by-case -case decision by the judge. So the Human Rights Committee's uh, opinion was that this is a progressive uh, 
standard by the CRPD committee, obviously so that this is still in contradiction to the right to vote yeah. as enshrined in the CRPD convention. Yeah. Yeah. So what we did, uh, and I played a humble role in that, I asked the government delegation of Spain uh, what are the objective standards given to the judges based on which they will decide whom they should be crime and whom not. And then the government delegation acknowledged that uh, they had no idea about that. They requested for some time to come back to us. They contacted their Supreme Court on the telephone and returned back and informed us that there were no such objective standards. So what was the trick in this argument? The trick was that the CRPD committee did not come up with uh, opening a public debate which can be easily derailed, uh, but we used their standard, the Human Rights Committee's standards as expressed in their general comment mm -hmm. on the matter, mm -hmm. showing that actually Spain was not complying with that. And then following this route with a large number of countries, you know, gradually we created a situation that hopefully we will reach the stage that most people will agree that the original uh, criteria which were set up in the general comment, which is an old general comment in the field, uh, are actually empty. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that would be the mm -hmm. peaceful way of uh, resolving the tension between the two. There may be areas where it doesn't work so well because uh, there is no standard provided by them. So then we have to have a critical, civilized, and as open as possible discourse about the tension in the standards themselves. Yeah, that, that's something which is very interesting which came up, right? Yeah. Thank you, sir. It was an honor to have you interview you for us. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for Thank talking you, sir. to us. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Thank you, sir.